go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for coming out this afternoon. Um, on behalf of the Race and Difference Initiative here at Emory University, I welcome you all to this afternoon to the New Frontiers in Race and Difference Lecture Series. My name is Amanda Lewis, and I'm a um, Associate Professor of Sociology and co-director of the Race and Difference Initiative, along with several of my colleagues who I can't see because of the lights, um, but I think are here. Before I introduce our speaker for today, let me also mention that um, our next speaker in the series will be Michelle Alexander, who will be coming on Wednesday, November 3rd, to speak about her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in an Age of Colorblindness, and there'll be lots more advertisement about that soon. But on to today. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce a friend and colleague, Barbara Ransby. A native of Detroit, um, Professor Ransby received a bachelor's degree from Columbia University and a PhD in history from the University of Michigan. She is currently a professor of African American Studies, Gender Women's Studies, and History, as well as Department Head Gender Women's Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. A historian, writer, and longtime political activist, Professor Ransby has published dozens of articles and essays about the complex interplay of race, class, and gender in US society. She is also the author of the award-winning Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision, published by the University of North Carolina Press. When I say award-winning, I don't just mean one or two awards. Um, any of us who've written a book would be happy with that accomplishment. Um, Barbara's book has won no less than eight esteemed awards, including the 2004 Outstanding Book Award by the Gustavus Meyer Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights, the 2003 Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Prize from the Association of Black Women Historians, the 2004 James Raleigh Prize from the Organization of American Historians. You can see where we're going from here. Um, she has also been awarded numerous personal distinctions, including the prestigious Catherine Prelinger Scholarship Award for her scholarly contributions to women's history. Barbara's work, while laudable for all the traditional scholarly reasons, is also admirable for its deep engagement with the world. A truly public intellectual, Barbara Ransby, is a regular contributor to a number of progressive media outlets and has throughout her career been deeply involved in working with progressive organizations, including co-founding the Black Radical Congress in 1998, initiating African American women in defense of ourselves in 1991, and most recently has founded Ella's Daughters, a network of activists, artists, scholars, and writers working in Ella Baker's tradition. She's also currently at work on two major projects, a political, bi political biography of Eslanda Cardoza Good Robson and a study of African-American feminist organizations in the 1970s. Finally, and I hope she won't mind me saying this, but she is also a most amazing friend, mentor, um, mother, and colleague. I was lucky to have Barbara as a colleague when I first started my um, academic career at the University of Illinois at Chicago in 2000. And aside from just generally providing important guidance to a junior colleague, she also provided us with home away from home for many Thanksgiving dinners, birthday celebrations, and other important events. I have long admired her deep commitments to her scholarship, her activism, and her extended family. She is obviously a real gem in many different ways. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Barbara Ransby to Emory University today. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. That was a lovely introduction. And this table, anyone who wants to come up here and comment on my remarks can do so. I uh, know this is for a very distinguished panel tomorrow. But um, I'm very, very happy to be here uh, at Emory. Um, Atlanta holds a special place in my, in my heart. My family is actually from, part of my family is from Georgia, so it always feels like a little bit of a, a homecoming uh, to come back here. And of course, my research on the civil rights movement brought me to uh, Atlanta many times. Um, I want to thank all the folks who've worked on the Race and Difference uh, Initiative, um, and particularly I want to thank um, Provost Earl Lewis, who um, is probably one of the people uh, who helped to, who is, is one of the people actually who helped to make my book possible um, as uh, someone who did a lot of mentoring and support uh, for me as a graduate student and a, and a young scholar. So, um, and also Amanda Lewis and Tyrone Foreman and the wonderful uh, group of people who have amassed here uh, at Emory University doing some really uh, exciting work. I'm happy to be here. I'm actually also really happy to be uh, the warm up act for Michelle Alexander, uh, who's coming next month, and I'm a real fan of her work, and I think it's really cutting edge work that's helping us understand um, 
the depth of the prison industrial complex, as it's been called for a while, but really understanding the ways in which race are deeply implicated uh, in the growing prison industry. So I urge you all to come out for that talk as well. I want to talk to you uh, this afternoon about the connection between race and history, uh, about how we see this racial moment through the filtered and sometimes fuzzy lens of the civil rights and the black freedom movement. And I should also say parenthetically that I come to you as both a scholar and an activist, and it's pretty hard for me to, um, to dissect out those two uh, identities. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I see the um, legacy of the 2008 presidential race uh, as we look at it through the lens of the civil, civil rights movement. But then I also want to talk a little bit about activism today and some of the, the lessons and challenges that I think young activists uh, are grappling with. Um, I titled this talk, Are We There Yet? Uh, because in the wake of the 2008 uh, election of this nation's first African-American president, uh, many people suggested that America had, in fact, arrived on the question of race. Uh, and many of us wanted to believe that it was truly an amazing moment. And I, um, I'm from Chicago uh, for the last 15 years, so I was a very strong supporter of, of Barack Obama, not without criticism, but, but a supporter nonetheless, and, and one of those people very hopeful uh, about the promise of what that campaign uh, represented. And I couldn't help thinking at the time about my grandmother, who actually was um, a sharecropper, my maternal grandmother, a sharecropper from Mississippi, my paternal grandmother, um, a, a domestic worker from, from this area, uh, what they would have thought about that moment. Uh, so it was not lost on me, the historic nature um, of that victory. I think many of us wanted to believe we had arrived because it had been such a long and arduous journey. Uh, and if we hadn't arrived, that we at least wanted to feel that we were almost there, that we were on the precipice of some sort of post-racial promised land. Now, just in case you're impatient um, with my question, are we there yet? Uh, the short answer is no, we're not. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about, about what I think that answer means. But even those who were the most intoxicated uh, by the promise and the potential of the, of the Obama uh, election in 2008, I think have, have sobered up over the past a couple of years and are really looking anew at what the campaign, what electoral politics, uh, represent in the larger body, body politic. But the larger and more complicated uh, answer to the question of how far has racial progress come is deeply embedded in how we see history, in how we recollect and reconcile with the past. And the election of 2000 was a moment in which the American public and the mainstream media were deeply immersed in a conversation about history the history of the civil rights and black freedom movements in particular, and in a different way and to a lesser extent, the history of the feminist movement uh, as well. For those of you who remember, uh, and it wasn't that long ago, so I hope even uh, those of you who weren't voting age at the time will remember, um, that over the course of the Democratic primary in particular, the name and the words of Dr. Martin Luther King were called up over and over. They were deployed for legitimacy, for purposes of moral currency and just plain street cred uh, by many of the candidates, most notably uh, Obama and Hillary Clinton. And so then the ghosts of Mississippi and Selma and Birmingham and Atlanta were resurrected time and again. I remember quite vividly the dueling Selma speeches uh, during, the, during the month of March in the primary season. Uh, Hillary Clinton was on one side of town in Selma and Barack was on the other side, both of them laying claim to the mantle, uh, the implicit mantle of leadership passed on from an older generation of freedom fighters. Standing in the historic Brown Chapel, Barack Obama said, don't tell me I don't have a claim on Selma. Don't tell me I'm not coming home when I come to Selma. And then he laid out his biblically inspired paradigm of the Joshua generation picking up the baton from the Moses generation. On the other side of town, Hillary, at First Baptist, flanked by some of the icons of the black freedom movement, told her audience, I come here as a grateful friend and beneficiary of the civil rights movement. She later recounted hearing a speech by Dr. King in Chicago, when she was actually still a Republican, but she didn't mention that at the time, uh, a speech that changed her life. 
Even the controversy over Jeremiah Wright, uh, if you remember Jeremiah Wright is, was Barack Obama's uh, minister in Chicago, even that uh, conflict represented an ultimate confrontation with history. If you recall, Barack Obama was, with, upon Hillary's insistence, uh, called upon to not only reject but to repudiate uh, Jeremiah Wright. And what he repudiated in Jeremiah Wright, which is not surprising for somebody running for the President of the United States, but what he repudiated is historically significant. Because what he repudiated was a certain tradition uh, in black radical political activism. Um, he repudiated the militancy and the alignment with other progressive organizations and oppressed communities, which had been kind of the mainstay uh, of Reverend Wright's career. He repudiated the internationalism and anti-imperialism of a certain strain of black um, activism. And he repudiated the kind of commitment and alliance and foregrounding of the interests of the black poor uh, and working class, which is really the, the uh, core mission of, of Trinity Church. And I'm, I'm not actually uh, a church-going uh, woman, but if I were, Trinity would be the kind of church I would go to. Uh, because it really is a tradition that's steeped in a certain kind of activism and a certain kind of loyalty to some of the most oppressed sectors uh, of the African-American community. So that was a significant um, turn, and that was a, a significant um, dance with history, if you will, a decision, pragmatic but, uh, but clear-headed, um, about what was necessary to go to the next stage in the presidential uh, campaign. Now the campaign was one thing in terms of the rhetoric about history and what the civil rights movement represented, a particular narrative of the civil rights movement, I should add, uh, represented. But in the wake of the November uh, victory, the hyperbole about the significance, the racial significance of Obama's victory was really over the top. So writing in the root, uh, columnist Jack White invoked W.B. Du Bois and proclaimed, quote, from now on, we don't need to worry about whether the dogged strength of our dark bodies alone will prevent us from being torn asunder. From now on, we don't have to choose. At long last, we can embrace our Americanness without betraying our blackness. Our body politic is finally healed. It's a tall order. Uh, and of course, this is taken from, this is a sort of um, rewording in, in response to W.E.B. Du Bois' um, writings. Uh, right around the same time, a CN, uh, CNN poll said that the, black, uh, the majority of black respondents felt that Dr. Tr Dr. King's dream had, in fact, been realized. And the civil rights icon, your congressman, uh, John Lewis, um, great hero of the, of the freedom struggles of the 1960s and SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, reflected back on the historic uh, Selma civil rights campaign of 1965 and said, Barack Obama is what we were crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge to reach. Now, Edmund Pettus Bridge was, of course, a very um, bloody uh, confrontation with the, uh, with the police, with the state troopers um, around a civil rights march that, um, that had been launched by the movement. And so it, it really has a particular resonance in the chronology, in the timeline, in the, in the memory of the civil rights movement. But he argued that Barack Obama, in other words, winning the presidency, putting a black man in the White House, a White House built by slave labor, uh, represented a kind of coming full circle, represented a culmination um, of the struggle. Now I started off saying, I'm not, I'm not going all the way down this road, it is a significant victory, uh, and I would be the last person to deny that, but I think in, in order to extract lessons uh, from that victory and also to um, to grapple with and um, manage the disappointment that some of us have felt uh, since that victory, we have to understand it in a, large, uh, in a larger historical context. I thought it was quite telling that while Congressman Lewis, with all due respect, uh, praised Obama's election as the prize that black people had ostensibly had their eyes on for decades, Gloria Richardson, how many people have heard of Gloria Richardson? Okay. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about her and you should, you should find out more. She's still alive and a very amazing woman. 